Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to the 400 Mini Show, in which we explore the built-in games of the 400 Mini retro gaming console, and onwards into some other games you might want to explore on the system. Today, something that might be a terrible idea, we're going to play a text adventure. If you want to do this on the 400 Mini, which doesn't have a working keyboard, I highly recommend hooking up a USB keyboard. Any USB keyboard is fine. Uh, I'm actually using the 8-bit Do um, Famicom style keyboard, which is a lovely a lovely retro style mechanical keyboard that's really nice to use with these mini systems. In theory you could play using the on-screen keyboard but that would be a very slow process and also probably a very good means of torturing your enemies. So I'm going to show you this game today on the understanding that while it might not be a plug and play game for the 400 mini due to it being best experienced with a bit of additional hardware and some other considerations that we'll come on to, it's representative of a very important part of gaming culture in the 1980s, specifically computer gaming, not console gaming or arcade gaming. The game you're looking at today is called Moon Mist, and it's a 1986 release from Infocom, who are a company that have become renowned the world over as being both the masters of and pioneers of the field of interactive fiction. And the reason I picked this game specifically is because it's one of the few titles from their extensive back catalogue that markets itself as being an introductory level adventure. That means two things really, it's easy and it's short. It's also a bit divisive among Infocom fans, but having tried it for the first time recently I found myself rather enjoying it, so I wanted to share it with you. A bit of context that is helpful to know. Adventure games, as in text adventure games, grew in popularity with the advent of home computers and they were seen as a rather more grown up and mature alternative to the arcade style games that were prevalent at the time. Many home computer magazines, including Page 6, which uh, various members of my family, including myself, wrote for, and Atari User had their own dedicated adventure game columns in each issue, and for a long time enthusiasts of this type of game actually looked down on titles with more elaborate visual presentation, believing that a good imagination and some well-written text is all you really need. Graphics were for children who just wanted to blast aliens. So, while these games might not look all that impressive today, what you need to bear in mind is back when they were originally released, a game having a considerable amount of text was seen as a notable technical accomplishment due to the limited memory that early home computers had. Infocom were pretty smart though. They took advantage of the disk drive revolution and loaded in text from the game disk as it was required rather than making compromises in order to have a game that was completely resident in memory. Or indeed, unfortunately, a game that cassette-based systems could actually play. Moon Mist does make a few compromises along the way still though, but we'll talk a little bit about those and the possible reasons for them as we play. So, let's go play Moon Mist. So, Moon Mist comes on two floppy disks, uh, which I've preloaded into our USB um, media access, and you'll also need an additional disk for save games. You could use the 400 mini save state function, uh, but I'm kicking it old school and I'm using a save game disk. That just has to be a blank formatted disk image in the case of the 400 mini. Um, I don't know if you have to put DOS on it. I don't think so. Uh, as long as it's got space for the save games, I think that's probably fine. All right. So I've loaded it up. It says insert side two of the story disk into drive one. Now on the 400 mini, you can load up to three disks, um, sort of preload up to three disks at once. And you swap between them by holding the home button on the joystick and pushing the back ring button. And you'll see that changes to disc two or three, which is disc two. So I can then press return and that will load the beginning of the game. So some things worth noting about um, Infocom games in particular. They were text adventures, as I say, they were pioneers in the field of interactive fiction, particularly for consumers. But one thing they often did was they uh, put additional stuff in the packaging besides the game disc and the manual. And these collectively became known as feelies because they were effectively props from the game world that you could hold in your hand and you could look at. And they were particularly important for Moon Mist for several reasons that we'll, we will talk about as we come to. So um, let's, let's just kick off and I'll explain uh, the relevant parts from the feelies as we get to them. So Moon Mist, Infocom Interactive Fiction, a mystery story, copyright 1986 by Infocom Incorporated, all rights reserved. It's worth noting this game did also come out on a bunch of other platforms, including the Atari ST, Amiga, um, and these days you can play it on pretty much anything that runs a, uh, a Z machine interpreter. But um, I'm playing it on the Atari 8-bit because this era of adventure game I very much associate with the Atari 8-bit. 
and those adventure game columns in magazines, like I mentioned. So I don't know if I want to say this is a more authentic experience, but it's certainly it's certainly how I associate Infocom games, if that makes sense. Okay, you drove west from London all day in your new little British sports car. Now at last you've arrived in the storied land of Cornwall. Dusk has fallen as you pull up in front of Tresillian Castle. A ghostly full moon is rising, and a tall iron gate between two pillars bars the way into the courtyard. What would you like to do? So if you've never come across a text adventure before, this is how it works. It tells you something, and then you tell it what you would like to do. So, we are outside the gates of a castle where we are expected, and so I'm going to blow my horn. So I type blow horn. It takes a moment to access the disc and pull out the appropriate response. The dragon's eye glows red. A voice comes from a hidden speaker. It says, please announce yourself, state your title, such as Lord or Lady, Sir or Dame, Mr or Ms, and your first and last name. So here, I just pop in my name, or you can be as silly as you like. But we'll be, we'll be sensible today. Did you say your name is Mr Pete Davison? Yes. And what is your favourite colour, Mr Davison? Now this is a surprisingly important question, because Moon Mist has four roots. Uh, that you can take through the story and they all start in the same way but the details that follow are different so you have a slightly different mystery to solve uh, depending on um, which color you pick there are four available there's red blue green and yellow i believe red is the easiest and yellow is the most complicated and difficult um, you can do them in any order. If you say a favourite colour that is not one of those things, it will pick one of them randomly for you. Um, but yeah, if, if you want to sort of optimise your playthrough, uh, you pick one of them at this point. So the only route I haven't done so far is yellow. So I'm going to pick the yellow route. Did you say your favourite colour is yellow? Just making sure that we are sure about that. Jolly good. The spare bedroom is decorated in yellow. Please enter. The red eye turns green and the front gate creaks open. What next? Drive through gate. Your headlights bravely pierce the gloom as you enter the courtyard. You get out of your car. The front gate closes and locks behind you. You are now in the courtyard. As floodlights blaze on, you look around. It looks even lovelier than it sounds in the tourist brochure. That phrase, that phrase we'll get very used to for reasons I will explain in a moment. The dark stone turrets rise toward the misty sky. Your new little yellow sports car is parked there. See, our favourite colour is yellow, so our car is yellow. Someone comes running out of the wing to greet you. She's a beautiful red-haired young woman of average height. You recognise her as your friend, Tamara Lind. Pete, she cries with outflung arms. You sweet thing, to answer my letter in person this way, and all the people I wrote about are here tonight for Lionel's memorial birthday dinner. After a warm hug, she asks, asks anxiously, you did read my letter and not just give it a hasty glance. Now, Tamara's letter is one of the feelies. In fact, it's two of the feelies because you have two letters from her. Uh, one is sort of explaining her situation, which is that she, she is your friend from America, but she came over to England and she met this guy called uh, Lord Jack Tresellian, fell in love with him, and now they're engaged. But then a little bit nearer to the time you got this letter from her which i will read to you now help i think someone is trying to kill me i know this sounds dramatic but i really am worried you know i've never believed in ghosts but now i've actually seen the white lady the white lady is a legendary ghost that is associated with Tresillian castle and again among the feelies there is a tourist brochure about Tresillian castle uh, which is the tourist brochure that's mentioned in the description there, and a book of legends uh, of Cornish ghosts, of which the White Lady is one. It was so frightening. I woke up in the middle of the night, and there she was, looking down on me. She had this terrible pale face, which suddenly disappeared. Then an enormous black widow spider dropped onto my bed. I screamed and shook it off my blanket, and by the time Jack got there, it was gone. At first... I thought it was just a horrible dream, but a few days later I opened my desk drawer and an adder reared out and, sorry, uh, she, she writes in, in very nice handwriting but it's quite difficult to read, an adder reared out and almost bit me. Adders are such poisonous snakes that you can die from the bite. This time the snake was found, so I know it really happened. 
No one had ever been threatened by the white lady before, but some of the people who have seen the ghost recently say it looks just like Deirdre... Deirdre... Helen, I think that is. Um, that old girlfriend of Jack's who drowned in the castle well. Yeah, so the previous uh, the previous squeeze of Lord Jack Tresselian died under mysterious circumstances a little while back. And so there is some conjecture that the white lady might, might actually be the ghost of this uh, young woman who may or may not have been wronged. Do you think she's come back to torment me for taking his place? I don't know what to do. I know it's a, a big favour to ask because it's such a long way. But won't you please come to help me? You solve so many mysteries. I'm sure you can figure out this one. Love, Tamara. Yeah, so that is the setup there. So we now we have now read her letter, so we can say yes. Then you know about my engagement and the white lady and the fact that, that someone is trying to kill me. Yes. She hugs you with affection. I'm so glad you're here. You won't see what next anymore. So now we just get the prompt on uh, on what we want to do next so what we can do is we can ask tamara about the white lady have a brief moment while the parser passes our sentence and retrieves the appropriate bit of text from the disc I've told you all I know in my letter, Pete, but come to think of it, there's an old history book in the library that tells about Drusillian Castle. You might learn more from that. All right, let's ask Tamara about Jack. Another pause. This was, this was part of the fun of text adventures back in the day. If you got a load time, something interesting was about to happen, usually. Here comes Jack now, exclaims Tamara as he comes striding towards you. He's a tall, handsome, dark-browed young man in dinner jacket and black tie. My fiancé, Lord Jack Tresillian, Tamara introduces him. Jack, this is my friend from the States, Mr. Pete Davison. So you're that famous young sleuth whom the Yanks call Mr. Sherlock, says Lord Jack, shaking hands. Tammy's told me about the mysteries you've solved. His keen blue eyes size you up with a friendly twinkle. Yet his friendliness seems to be all on the surface. It may take time to figure out where his lordship's really coming from. We can talk later, Pete, says Tamara, taking her arm. But let's go in now so you can meet the other guests. Yes, do come in. Bolifo will see to the car and bring your luggage, says Lord Jack, as an elderly butler appears. He has your luggage. OK, enter the house. Tamara guides you into the foyer. As you enter the foyer, you're overwhelmed by the English past. Those barbarous times when Jack's ancestors had to shut themselves up in a castle have softened into gracious country living. Yet Tamara is clearly anxious. You're in the foyer. So, uh, we can carry on asking Tamara about things or we can just proceed where we know we need to go. So I'm going to head to the east. Tamara guides you into the drawing room. You are now in the drawing room. It looks even lovelier than it sounds in the tourist brochure. A tall, graceful, older couple in evening clothes are chatting and sipping sherry. Lord Jack introduces them as Montague Hyde and Vivian Pentreath. Hyde smiles and bows stiffly, and Vivian murmurs in an attractively low voice, How do you do, Mr Davison? Believe it or not, this young man is a famous American detective, Lord Jack tells him. Not a police detective, of course, Tamara adds as they both stiffen, but a solver of all sorts of mysteries in the States. We're hoping to find out who or what is haunting Tristillian Castle. Okay, let's ask Vivian about the white lady. Another pause. Make your own disk drive access noises. Oh, she has haunted Tresselian Castle for centuries, a lovely phantom in a white gown with long, pale hair. She was said to be the unfaithful wife of an early Lord Tresselian who had a wall up alive in the tower. So that is the legend of the White Lady. Um, she was, she cheated on her husband, he found out, and so he bricked her up in a wall, which is not okay. That is not a nice thing to do, regardless of what she might have done. It's not okay. Um, which is why she's supposedly haunting the castle now. Uh, let's see if Hyde knows anything about the White Lady. Yeah, 
anything exactly the same <laughs> so you see, you see there are certain limitations uh, to what the game can cope with okay um, let's look at Tamara she's a beautiful red-haired young woman of average height Tamara guides you into the new great hall you are now in the new great hall it looks even lovelier than it sounds in the tourist brochure the hall is floored with black and white marble tiles. They've been worn smooth by footsteps over the centuries, especially near the archway to the drawing room. Bolitho is walking along. A young couple are dancing to the faint sound of rock music from a portable radio on a table nearby. The girl is a stylish London Deb type. Her dark hair is cut boyishly short. Her height and figure will make her a perfect high fashion model. He's a tall blonde, sporting a white dinner jacket and scarlet cummerbund. He moves with the elegant swagger of a guards officer and young man about Mayfair, both of which he is. They stop dancing, turn off the radio and greet you. Tamara introduces them as the Honourable Iris Vane and Lieutenant Ian Fordyce of Her Majesty's Coldstream Guards. My dear, what a handsome addition to your guest list, chirps Iris. Her green... Iris, rather, not Irish. <laughs> her green eyes sparkle flirtatiously as she offers you her delicate hand. Tell me, Mr. Davison, you one of those brutally fascinating American private eyes? Why, yes, I certainly am. Splendid. Do excuse me for interrupting, Tamara breaks in, but here comes Dr. Wendish. I'm sure Pete wants to meet such a distinguished scientist. A man is coming downstairs. He's a middle-sized man in his 50s with spectacles and a grizzled moustache. Tamara introduces him as one of Lionel's oldest friends, Dr. Nicholas Wendish. He's carelessly dressed, dressed in rumpled evening clothes, but his hawk eyes peering at you through gold-rimmed specks show ruthless intelligence. I read about one of your mystery cases while I was in New York last year, Mr. Davison, he probes. Is that a case that brings you to Cornwall? Bolithek walks upstairs. He is carrying your luggage. So yes, it is a case that brings me here. I see. Let's go upstairs. You two will have time to chat later, says Tamara, but you must excuse us now, Dr. Wendish, while I show Pete up to his bedroom. I'm sure he wants to freshen up for dinner. Tamara guides you up to the gallery. She says, I know it's confusing, but the British call this the first floor. We just left the ground floor. This was confusing to me the first time I went to the States and the ground floor was called the first floor, which I suppose makes more sense, but it's just what you're used to, I guess. The gallery spans the top of the double stairways. You can go east to your bedroom or west to Vivian's bedroom. Hallways lead to the northeast and northwest. On the wall is a series of oil paintings of Lord Jack's ancestors. Bolitho is walking along. He enters your bedroom. He's carrying your luggage. Now, in a lot of adventure games, you will probably want to make a map as you move around. Um, I found that in Moon Mist, the layout of the castle is small enough and intuitive enough that you don't really need to make a map. Uh, there is also a map included in the feelies as part of the tourist brochure so you can use that to find your way around as well although that does not include every single room that you can get into it also does not include some secret passages you can find your way into but for now let's head into our bedroom by going east tamara guides you into your bedroom she says you'll be sleeping in the same room that queen victoria slept in you are now in your bedroom the room is decorated in shades of yellow you see your bathroom to the north and a cosy fireplace in one corner. The room is furnished with a bed, a night table with a lamp on it, a chest of drawers, a wardrobe, a wing chair and a dressing table with mirror and bench. There's also a full length wall mirror. On your bed you see your luggage. Bolitho is waiting patiently. She turns to leave saying, here's Bolitho so I'll leave you to rest or freshen up Pete. Dinner's at eight by the way or whenever you hear the gong. She leaves. And you see up in the top right corner there is the time it is 7 15 pm everything you do advances the time slightly you can also choose to wait for however many minutes you want to so if you know something specific is going to happen at a specific time you can wait for that time right bolitho comma unpack my luggage that is how you command another character to do something in a text adventure as you wish mr davison he empties your luggage into the chest of drawers. Ask Bolitho about the white lady. Having a think. 
They do say Tresselian Castle is haunted. You had that much disc accessing for that. Fine. Ask Bolitho about Deirdre, which is Lord Jack's previous squeeze. Anything? Perhaps you've heard how I was sent to the basement to find her. I found a tent pole and a shoe in front of the well, near one end of the wine rack. The pole belonged to Lord Lionel. The shoe's spike heel was wrenched loose. I knew at once there had been an accident. Apparently Miss Deirdre, in her cups, had stumbled over the pole and grabbed at the well for support. But as she was nowhere in sight and her red necklace was lying beside the well, I assumed she had toppled down the well. When Lord Jack arrived, he shone an electric torch down the well and discovered a strand of fabric from her gown, snagged on a jagged bit of brickwork. Evidently, it was ripped off as she fell. At any rate, the police concluded that she had drowned. They lowered a diver into the well, but Deirdre's body was never found. Ask Bolitho about Jack. Anything? I'm afraid it's not my place to say, Mr. Davison. Okay. Um, don't really know what else to say to him at the minute, so let's wait. I assume you mean wait ten minutes. Bobby coughs diffidently and asks, Mr. Davison, am I right in assuming that you are the well-known young American detective? Why, well, yes, I am young and American, as you can hear from my accent. Then no doubt you are here to investigate the spectral figure which has recently been seen about the castle. I myself glimpsed the ghost just last night. Lord Jack and some guests were sitting up late, lounging and chatting in the new Great Hall. After they retired, I came upstairs to clean up and turn off the lights. As I entered the new Great Hall from the west, I saw the ghost on the far side of the room. You've seen that room, have you not? Yes, I have. I've been in there, even. Uh, to be precise, the ghost was just beyond the archway. It was bending over, groping for something on the drawing room carpet. He continues, the ghost must have heard my footsteps, for it stood up, flashed me a startled glance, and fled into the darkness of the drawing room. I pursued, turning on the lights, but the thing had disappeared. I went into the foyer, but it was not there either, and the front door was still locked from the inside. Interesting. Yes. I see. Uh, may I offer one last suggestion? Adds Bolitho. Yes. Should you find yourself in any danger from my ghost, perhaps you could use this. Well, it gives you a small aerosol device. Uh, by the way, Mr. Davison, should you wish to view yourself from all angles while dressing, you can do so by adjusting the wall mirror and the hinged side mirror of the dressing table. Without explaining further, Bolitho abruptly leaves the room. Okay, so if there's only one thing for it. Take off clothes. Okay, my, what a fine figure of a man. We are in the land of fantasy, after all. Let's head north into our bathroom. You are now in your bathroom. From the look of it, your bathroom was added in recently. It is comfortable and inviting, especially for Cornwall. Bathe. What do you want to bathe in? The bath, obviously. You see, that takes a bit of time. First you drop everything. You're now squeaky clean. After toweling off, you feel nicely relaxed and ready to tackle the mystery of Tresselian Castle. So let's head back into our room. Dress for dinner. Ah, nothing like our new outfit to change your whole outlook. Right, now we can get to the business of investigating. You're in the gallery. Now, if you can't remember what an area looks like, you can either type look or you can turn on verbose mode, which means that room descriptions will appear every time you enter a particular area. Right, so let's head downstairs and follow up on that clue that Bolitho gave us. You're in the new Great Hall. It looks even lovelier than it sounds in the tourist brochure. Now, I said a little while ago that this phrase would come up a lot and you've probably noticed it coming up a fair amount already. What it means when that comes up is that the full room description is in the tourist brochure. So for whatever reason, whether it was they couldn't fit all the text on the disc or they wanted to ensure that people had the feelies, either for copy protection purposes or just to encourage people to read them, um, yeah, a lot of Moonmist text is actually in the feelies. So um, if we look up the new Great Hall in the tourist brochure, this is what it says. 
In the Middle Ages, entire families lived and slept in the castle's Great Hall. By the time the Tresillian family built their new Great Hall, the room was used mostly for holiday entertaining and for conducting important business. When the local villagers arrived for Christmas dinner, <coughs> excuse me, need a drink, a lot of talking in this game. Ah, let's try that again. When the local villagers arrive for Christmas dinner, they are seated around the long oak table in the centre of the room. A fire is lit in the massive fireplace, which is decorated with the Tresillian coat of arms. The elaborate wood carving surrounding the fireplace extends upward through a vast open stairwell to the gallery, where the portraits of Tresillian ancestors gaze down upon the festivities. The suit of armour standing by the bronze doors was worn by Sir Geoffrey Tresillian at Bosworth Field in 1485. You might think that a knight wearing this armour would feel protected. However, the metal is so heavy that even a strong man had difficulty walking, and fighting an enemy or riding a horse was nearly impossible. So, nothing that seems immediately relevant there, but in one of the routes that suit of armour is relevant, for example. Now, Bolitho told us that something funny was going on with the ghost. He was looking for something on the floor. So if we search the floor... The hall is floored with black and white marble tiles. They've been worn smooth by footsteps over the centuries, especially near the archway to the drawing room. Nothing suspicious meets your eye after a moment's scrutiny. Do you want to continue? Yes, I do. You don't find anything new there. Nothing there? Really nothing there? No. Okay. All right. Let's go into the drawing room. You're in the drawing room. It looks even lovelier than it sounds in the tourist brochure. Vivian is studying colours and Hyde is examining objects. Now let's look up the drawing room in the guide. The airy drawing room is where the Tresillian family meets to enjoy each other's company as well as that of their guests. The Dresden blue walls and furnishings soothe the senses and complement the elegant gold leaf frames around the many mirrors and paintings. The spacious feeling is enhanced by the tall French windows which overlook Frobsant's Cove to the east and the formal gardens to the north. The Belgian tapestry on the south wall is a treasured family heirloom. Woven of wool and spun gold, it depicts a maiden tending a unicorn in a beautiful rose garden. The satin cushion of the small gold-leafed armchair before the fireplace bears the imprint of Queen Victoria, for this is where she sat on her visit to Tresillian Castle in 1867. So there is a bum print of uh, Queen Victoria in here. Let's search the floor in here. The carpet ends flush with the archway to the new Great Hall, where the footsteps of visitors have begun to wear it thin. It's a magnificent deep red ugh. it's a magnificent red Brussels carpet with deep pile and a medieval design. Nothing suspicious meets your eye after a moment's scrutiny. Yes, we will continue. Suddenly, you notice a glittering speck. Probing for it with your fingers, you discover a tiny red jewel. Vivian says, it's time for dinner now. Let's go to the dining room. She opens the door for a moment and enters the new Great Hall. Let's make sure we take that jewel with us. You are now holding the tiny red jewel. Alright, let's go get ready for dinner. Ian and Iris are lounging and chatting. He walks west. The ground floor corridor goes between the two great halls to the east and west. Behind sliding doors, the dining room is north and the sitting room is south. Ian is walking along. He opens the door for a moment and enters the dining room. Alright, let's follow him. You open the door and close it again. You are in the dining room. This room is impeccably furnished, but it's too formal for relaxing. Tamara and Lord Jack and Vivian and Dr. Wendish and Ian are waiting patiently. Bolitho is walking along. A brooding bust of Lionel Tresillian, sculpted by Vivian, is displayed in the corner. You see the sideboard and the dining table here. On the sideboard you see your dinner and a punch bowl. Bolitho enters backstairs. So, get dinner. You look around and notice that no one else is eating yet. Hyde enters and nods to you. Iris enters and nods to you. Alright, let's, let's sit down then. You're now sitting on the chair. Suddenly, the dinner bell sounds. Iris playfully suggests to Lord Jack that everyone form a self-serve food line at the buffet. He and the others good-naturedly accept her suggestion. As Lord Jack takes his place as host, he notices a note lying on his napkin. 
He picks it up and reads it with a troubled expression. Several people glance at your outfit with approval. Lord Jack announces his engagement to Tamara, prompting various reactions from the guests. The dinner is excellent with a flow of subdued conversation. Eat dinner. You take a bite and find it delicious. Now I'm curious about that note that Jack got, so let's ask Jack about note. I have it right here, Mr. Davison. Jack, give me the note. Lord Jack hands you the butler's note. Read the butler's note. It says, Your Lordship, following instructions in your late Uncle Lionel's will, the other servants and I have left the castle after sounding the dinner gong. We shall remain away until tomorrow morning. I regret to inform you that Gladys, the upstairs maid, will not return with the rest of us. She wrote a note to your Lordship explaining the reason. She told me that she put it on the writing desk in the sitting room. Signed, Bolitho. Okay, well that's interesting, isn't it? Let's just look around. You're in the dining room. You're sitting on the chair. Uh, we've seen all that. Lord Jack and his guests are startled as an unexpected voice suddenly speaks. Good evening, all, it says, then breaks into a low chuckle. <laughs> Good Lord, Jack gasps. That's Uncle Lionel's voice. Dr. Wendish points to the bronze bust. There's where it's coming from. Let's just wait and see what happens. Lionel's voice continues. You are all here, I trust, to honour the wish expressed in my will, that the seven of you should dine together at Tresillian Castle on the evening of my birthday. Lionel's voice continues. As you know, I enjoyed adventuring to remote corners of the world, and doubtless you've all heard of the loss of that valuable artefact which I brought back from one of my expeditions, have you not? The guests nod or mumble vaguely. They all glance towards Jack as if looking for an official response. You'll notice every time I say like, wait, it says I assume you mean wait 10 minutes. Um, but if you look at the clock in the corner, it's not advancing by 10 minutes. That's because if you type in a wait command and something happens during the period of time that you're waiting, it will stop you waiting automatically. So you, you, you don't you don't waste time. You have to solve this whole game by 7 a.m. the following morning. Otherwise, you lose, basically. Um, it's not really explained very well why you lose when you reach 7 a.m. the following morning, but you, you do. That's the amount of time you've got to finish it, which is plenty of time, to be fair. Um, but just be aware of that. Let's continue waiting. Diana's voice goes on. The truth is that the artifact is not lost, but hidden. Although I am not yet ready to reveal what it is, I suggest you look under the punch bowl. All right, let's do exactly that then. Look under punch bowl. You stand up first. You find the first clue underneath, so you take it. Read the first clue. The first clue shows a photo of singer Pearl Bailey. This first clue is merely to sharpen your wits, Lionel's voice goes on. Deirdre, my dear, your one goal in life, I believe, is to become Jack's wife. Heaven knows why. Not being Cupid, there is little I can do to help. Knowing the others, I suspect each one has private reasons for wanting my hidden treasure. So, for your amusement, I have given a second clue to my heir, which may start you down the path to finding it. With another sardonic chuckle, Lionel's voice adds, <laughs> Perhaps, Lord Jack, you would care to share your clue with all the others, eh? What? That little bit there, the eh what at the end. I've seen Americans review this game and not understand that eh what is uh, an affectation of the posh, um, particularly in um, British literature. It's, it, it's a sort of stereotypical thing that, that some people do actually say. It's like, oh, that's marvellous, eh what? It doesn't mean anything. It's just a. It's just a sort of. I guess you call it like a non-fluency feature almost. It's just. It's just a means of filling additional space in a sentence, um, in the same way that you. In the same way that you say um or, uh, or whatever or, or fart for attention. I don't know. Anyway, um, Jack, share your clue. He fumbles in his pocket and produces it. T 
tech second clue and read it because yes you can do compound sentences in intracom games you are now holding the second clue Lionel's voice finishes so now my friends let the game begin it says yet the ear distinctly tells how the danger sinks and swells by the sinking or the swelling in the anger of the so it would be something that rhymes with tells swells bells wells okay so we now have three things to achieve and you can check on your progress by typing score um, unlike uh, many other Infocom games, you don't have a numerical score in this. You have this sort of ranking of um, of what you've done. So our score so far is, well, so far you've met Lord Jack and all of the guests, washed up from your trip, worn the proper outfit to dinner, but you haven't found the hidden treasure, nor enough evidence, nor identified the ghost. So the hidden treasure is fairly self-explanatory. You've got to find it. The evidence part is to do with what happened to Deirdre. You have to discover what happened to her. Um, and identifying the ghost, uh, because of course the ghost isn't real, it's someone posing as the ghost, you have to figure out uh, the explanation for it. So, let's get started. Let's leave the dining room. You open the door and close it again. You're in the ground floor corridor. It says south to the sitting room. It looks even lovelier than it sounds in the tourist brochure. Who would have thought it? Who'd have thought it? It's a comfy place to read a book, play the piano, or just relax. Let's look it up in the tourist brochure, just in case there is anything useful in here. The sitting room is a delightful place to spend an idle afternoon. It is filled with warm colours and invitingly comfortable furniture. The yellow silk brocade has covered the walls for over a hundred years, and the faded carpet patterned with peacocks and chrysanthemums was purchased in India by Lady Gail Tresillian in 1912. A guest at the castle might write a letter at the Louis XV writing desk that once belonged to Marie Antoinette, or play a romantic melody on the grand piano, especially built by the Klugenhofer Klavierwerker in Germany, or curl up with a book on the window seat, charmingly decorated with small carved wyverns projecting like gargoyles from either end. Now, you'll notice that there are several details in that description from the brochure that are not listed on the screen there, which is why you have to read the brochure. And you, if you want to play this game, you should have access to the brochure, either in PDF format or uh, print it out. Or if you're lucky enough to have the original, make use of that. So you may recall from the butler's note that he said the head maid had left a note on the desk in the sitting room. So if we examine desk... You can see the maid's note on the writing desk. Get maid's note, then read it. You are now holding the maid's note. It says, Today, while cleaning the room of a certain person who shall be nameless, I was shocked to discover something dreadful. I know I knows the place. I hope I know me place, your lordship, but I was brought up to be a perfectly respectable young woman, and I cannot go on working under the same roof where such wickedness takes place. I am not the type of girl given to idle gossip, so I will only say this. Maybe there is more reason than anyone suspects why that so-called ghost prowls about the castle at night, if you know what I mean. Maybe you will also be surprised to learn that a certain pet shop in Frobzant sells more than just harmless puppies, kittens and budgies. Interesting. Okay. So the maid's note is there in all four routes and the last paragraph normally points you towards um, part of the mystery. It normally helps you in identifying what happened to Deirdre. Um, so that is a clue to be getting on with. Um, what else? So let's head out. Let's head to the west. You are now in the junction. The two halves of the Tresillian Castle meet here as the past meets the present. West again. You are now in the old Great Hall. Your footfalls echo across the ancient stone floor. Now, I'm suspicious about that poem. I think the, the word missing is either bells or wells. So if we go up. The first floor corridor is lined with doors. To the west, a heavy oak door with ancient wrought iron fittings bears a bronze bas relief of the Tresillian family crest, marking this as the master bedroom of the castle. Other doors lead to the northwest, east, northeast, and southeast. Stairways go up at the south end and down at the north end. I'm going to continue upwards. The stairs curve up to the right. You are now in the second floor corridor. 
Light comes from the fighting deck. The second floor corridor has doors leading to the north, south and southeast. Stairways go up at the east end and down at the west end. I'm going to continue upwards. The stairs curve up to the right. You are now on the fighting deck. The roof of the tower keep has a stone floor and battlements all around. Far below, the faint sound of the sea cries from the darkness. In the moonlight, you see a huge bell mounted on a heavy frame. Search bell. In the bell is a third clue, so you stop searching. Get third clue and read it. You are now holding the third clue. It says, And so all the night tide I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride in her tomb by the sounding sea. All right, I happen to know where the tomb is, so let's head down and down again and down again. So we're now back on the ground floor in the old great hall. Head down again into the basement. You go quickly toward the basement. You are now in the basement. The basement of the tower keep still holds traces of the medieval past, such as an ancient well. The basement now stores both Lionel's expedition gear and the castle wine cellar. The brick walls are damp and mossy. A stairway lies north and doors lead east and west. I'm just going to take a quick detour to the east because there's a brass lantern here. Get lantern and turn. It gets a bit confused if you say things like turn it on. Turn on lantern. Okay, it is now on. Right, back to the basement. Uh, doors lead east and west. Let's continue west. You are now in the dungeon. Light comes from the brass lantern. In the northwest corner is an ancient door called a priest hole. Another exit is east to the basement. The light reveals an iron maiden here. Right, examine iron maiden. The inner surface of this medieval torture device is covered with spikes. The space is just big enough to hold an unfortunate victim. Get in. Iron Maiden. As you step on the bottom of the Iron Maiden, it sinks downward into the secret tomb. You step out again. You feel a cold shiver run down your back. You are now in the secret tomb. Light comes from the brass lantern. The light reveals the Iron Maiden and a stone coffin here. Open coffin. You open it and see a fourth clue. Get fourth clue. And read it. You are now holding the fourth clue. If you search for a cask of Amontillado, Amontillado, don't get trapped. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. As you step on the bottom of the Iron Maiden, it rises again to the dungeon. You step out again. You are in the dungeon. Uh, head to the east. Now, I'm going to save here. Um, because I haven't died in this game yet. Um, but I, I know it is possible to die in just a couple of circumstances. So I'm just going to swap to my disc number three, which is my save game disc. And save my game. And then switch back to side two and continue right um search for a cask of amontillado i don't know the word cask well that's helpful isn't it read fourth clue if you search for a cask of amontillado don't get trapped. Search for a montillado. I don't know whether you're really not helping me out here. Hmm. Search wine rack. In the wine rack, you see only an assortment of wine. 
Okay, I guess I guess what we're looking for isn't here then. Let's check the kitchen. The kitchen is large yet cramped. From here you can go west to the tower basement, east to the servants' quarters, or up the stairs. Um, let's go west. And up. And up. Now, a cask of Amontillado almost looked like the title of something. So I wonder if there's something in the library, which I believe is to the northeast. Yes. Search bookcases. Some of the books date as far back as the 16th century. Although some are fiction, most of the books are scientific, covered with vellum or leather. Some are in foreign languages, and many have pictures of skulls or spirits. A history book catches your eye. Get history book. As you move the history book, the bookcase creaks open, revealing a secret passage. I did happen to know that was there already. But uh, that's an example of how you can open up the secret passages that allow you to get quickly from one place to another. I say quickly, it's not really that much quicker than just going there, but if you, for some reason, you need to stay out of sight, uh, you can do that. Uh, search desk. You can't see any desk right here. All right, it's the table. Search table. There's nothing on it. Good. Good. All right, what about northwest? You're now in the study. Light comes from the brass lantern. Lord Jack's private study has rich mahogany furniture and hunting prints on the walls. Don't see anything useful there. What about to the east? You're now in the office. Light comes from the brass lantern. This small office gets little light and less air. In one corner is a computer. By the fireplace there is a tall, old-fashioned desk with an inkwell and a tall stool. Search desk. You can see the inkwell on the old-fashioned desk. Good. That is the treasure in one of the routes, not this one. Uh, examine stool. You look over the stool for a minute and find nothing suspicious for now. If you're wondering, uh, a Montelado is a type of sherry, I think it is. Um, so if we're looking for a cask of that, I would have thought that would be in the wine cellar, but it, it doesn't appear to be down there. Um, let's go up. Second floor corridor has doors leading to the north, south, and southeast. North is the game room. The game room has a billiard table and card table with various chairs and standing ashtrays. On the wall there are a cue rack, gun rack, and mounted heads of a rhino and cape buffalo. Don't think any of that is relevant right now. Let's head south. You are now in the chapel. A bare and austere yet poignantly atmospheric relic of the medieval past, the chapel contains an altar, pulpit, font, and family pews of elaborately carved oak. The most memorable feature is this splendid stained glass window. It portrays in vividly glowing colours Eve tempting Adam with the forbidden apple in the Garden of Eden. Again, not relevant right now, I don't think. That is relevant in one of the other routes. You are now in the lumber room. Light comes from the brass lantern. This is lumber in the British sense, meaning used to stuff like old magazines, an all eight birdcage, an ancient chest from the 1700s, and a broken Victorian hobby horse. Get magazine and read it. Too bad, but the fourth clue slips from your arms while you are taking it and both tumble on the floor. You are carrying too many things. All right, drop all clues. Get magazine and read it. You're now holding the magazine. This is an old copy of Punch, good for a laugh or two. Drop magazine and take fourth clue.
drop Butler's note. Okay, it is now on the floor. Okay, um... Hmm. I can see why this is said to be the, the hardest um, the hardest of the the routes through the game. You see, the, the clues are a lot more obtuse in this one. Um, where would we find a cask of Amontillado if it's not in the wine cellar? it outside you open the door and close it again you are now on the path this is an area behind shrubbery by a steep cliff overlooking the sea in the dim light you can barely see a path leading north along the cliff a priest hole and a lever are on the outer wall you start to follow the path but it's too tricky to in the dim light so you turn back okay nothing much there then in that case um Let's have a look at the tourist brochure and see if there's anything about wine casks anywhere. I suspect it isn't because I don't think it covers the basement. No, nothing about... Nothing about casks. Dining room from the look of things. Nothing in the junction. The old great hall has some mementos from Lord Lionel's travels, um, which includes an oil painting of the Battle of Blood River. An exquisite carving in Chinese jade of a rather ape-like pre-human skeleton, probably some ancestor of modern man. A giant oyster shell from the South Pacific Ocean, its interior surface mysteriously lacquered jet black. And a papier-mâché figure of an Amazon Indian dressed in the weird costume of a tribal witch doctor performing the elaborate secret ritual by which the anaesthetic drug used on the tribal blowgun dance is extracted from the rare moonflower plant. Okay, nothing relevant, unfortunately. Hmm. Hmm. I might have to cheat a bit here just for the sake of this video. So I'm going to look it up on the Universal Hint System website, which I, I highly recommend to anyone who gets stuck on a game like this. So Moon Mist UHS. So in the crime, yellow. The fourth clue. Have you ever read any Edgar Allan Poe? Namely, as the clue suggests, the cask of Amontillado. Oh, it's an Edgar Allan Poe book. In that story, someone gets walled up in a basement. That can never really happen, could it? Why don't you find out? Okay. So, we know that supposedly... We know that supposedly the white lady is the um, the former Lady Tresalian who was walled up in in something. Search Lionel's gear. You look over the gear for a minute and find nothing suspicious for now. Well, the brick walls are damp and mossy, and some bricks look loose. Look bricks. I assume you mean look at it, not look in it, nor look for it, nor any other preposition. There's a bunch of loose bricks in the wall. Pull loose bricks. You manage to pull them down into a pile on the floor, making a large hole in the wall. Look at hole. 
Through the dusty air, you can see only dark inside, but the hole looks big enough to climb through. All right, here we go, into the hole. You are now in the secret crypt. Light comes from the brass lantern. This space at the bottom of the tower is so gloomy and musty that you should be glad there's an exit to the basement. The light reveals a skeleton here. Examine skeleton. Hanging on the neck of the skeleton is a black pearl necklace. Congratulations, Mr. Davis, and you've found the hidden treasure. Get necklace. You're now holding the black pearl necklace. Okay, right, so that is one of the things we need to achieve solved. Well, so far you've met Lord Jack and all of the guests, worn the proper outfit to dinner, discovered secret passages, discovered the hidden treasure, but you haven't enough evidence nor identified the ghost. Right. So, other things we need to do then. We need to follow up on the maid's note, which uh, suggested that a local pet shop was stocking more than just dogs and cats and things like that. Um, and we need to figure out what this jewel is. Examine jewel. You look over the tiny red jewel for a minute and find nothing suspicious for now. Okay, well the, the only place the only place I've seen... I'm not in it. Okay. Uh, where am I then? Exit. Okay, fair enough. The only place I know that there are animals is the game room, I think. Oops, that's wrong. up on the second floor. Search buffalo. You look over the stuffed buffalo head for a minute and find nothing suspicious for now. Search rhino. You can see nothing unusual inside it. Okay, well that's that then. Um, I wonder if I wonder if that was a reference to the Black Widow and the Adder that Tamara was attacked by. Hmm. I wonder. Okay, th things I know we haven't searched yet. We haven't searched the secret passages. Now, in the other routes, there isn't really anything in there. That doesn't necessarily mean something will be in there now. But it's worth a look. Uh, give necklace to Tamara. I thought she was here. Is she not? Okay, never mind. I was going to give the necklace there for safekeeping, but I think we're okay. You're in the new Great Hall. It looks even lovelier than it sounds in the tourist brochure. Yes, it does. All right, upstairs. Let's go to our bedroom. Search a wall a mirror. By running your fingers around the frame, you discover a hidden switch. Excuse me. Push switch. I knew this was here already as well. As you push the hidden switch, a section of the wall creaks open, revealing a secret passage. Enter passage. You step down and enter a narrow secret passage. You are now in your entrance. Light comes from the brass lantern. This is a musty and cobwebby secret passage between the wall of your bedroom and the outside wall of the castle. The secret passage leads north and south. An open secret door and a lever are on the west wall. A narrow stairway snakes down into darkness. Let's have a look down there then. You are now in the drawing room entrance. Light comes from the brass lantern. A secret door and a lever are on the north wall. A narrow stairway snakes up into darkness. Well, we may as well open all the secret passages from this side. That lets us get from one place to another. Uh, north. You hear a scurrying sound underfoot. 
Light comes from the brass lantern. A secret door and a lever are on the west wall. The secret passage leads north and south into darkness. The light reveals a blowgun and a ghost costume here. Interesting. Get blowgun and costume. You're now holding the blowgun. You are now holding the ghost costume. Examine blowgun. It's a bamboo tube, two feet long and as thin as a small snake. Examine costume. It's obvious that the wig was designed to resemble Deirdre's long flowing hair. Inside you notice several individual red hairs, the same colour as Tamara's hair. The gown seems to fluoresce in the dark. It has a low neckline and no sleeves. When you hold it up, you can see it would fit a person of average height. Congratulations, Mr. Davis, you've identified the ghost. So Tamara herself is the ghost. That's interesting. But why? But why? You enter the room cautiously after a preliminary peek. No one is there. You are now in Iris's bedroom. Iris's bedroom is furnished much like yours, but with a canopy bed and love seat. And there's a wide open secret door. Okay, I think we probably want to go and search Tamara's room. See if that gives us any clues as to why she's pretending to be the ghost and why she summoned us here, considering that she's the ghost. Crazy woman. All right, Tamara's is southeast. You are now in Tamara's bedroom. The room is utterly feminine in its decoration, yet neater than you might expect for a young woman of Tamara's age. Even her dressing table is in apple pie order, with her hand mirror, comb, brush, makeup kit, and jewelry case all precisely placed on its gleaming surface. Search dressing table. You look over the dressing table for a minute and find nothing suspicious for now. Search the makeup kit. Uh, okay. Search jewelry case. Inside the jewelry case is an earring, so you stop searching and take it. Examine earring. The jewel is missing from its setting. Put jewel in earring. Oops. You will probably know what I uh, what I mean. The jewel fits the empty earring perfectly. You remove the jewel again. Congratulations, you found evidence of the crime. Now this is one criticism that people have of this game, uh, which is that it tells you you've solved it, but doesn't necessarily explain it. So I think all we need to do now is go and confront Tamara. Ah, we don't have enough evidence. Okay, so we still need to find some more. Search jewelry case. See if there's anything else in there. Sometimes you do have to search things uh, more than once. In the jewelry case, you see only an assortment of jewelry. You freeze as the door bursts open and Tamara appears. She stares at you with a shocked look. Well, I didn't expect my room to be searched, she says angrily. She enters the door and closes the room behind her. Apologise. I assume you mean Tamara. Apology accepted. Okay, ask Tamara about earring. She flinches a little before answering. I just don't know, Pete. I think you're lying. Uh, ask Tamara about costume. I've uh, never seen it before. You are lying to me. But I don't know how to prove it. Aside from... Aside from... I don't know. Show earring to Tamara. She flinches a little before answering. It looks like an earring to me. Accuse Tamara. 
would be difficult to convict her with the evidence you found. If you hope to put the culprit behind bars, you will need more convincing proof. Okay, yeah, so we need something else. We need something else to prove what's been going on. Um, and how we do that. Sorry, I, I am searching the UHS again, just, just so we get this done in a reasonably timely manner. Um, must be something else in their room. Search bed. Tamara prevents your action. Ooh, okay. Um, we need to get her out of the way. You open the door and close it again. Tamara opens the door for a moment and follows you. Are you that stupid? You are that stupid. Good. Search bed. Neatly under the bed is the journal. So you stop searching and take it. Get journal and read it. You're already holding the journal. This is a journal of Lionel's South Pacific Expedition. As you leaf through it, you find a description of a treasure, a black pearl necklace. Okay, that's what we found. Search bed. See if there's anything else. Neatly hidden under the bed is Tamara's receipt, so you stop searching and take it. Read receipt. It's a receipt for the purchase of an adder from a pet shop in Frobsance. Someone has written the word iris on it and they've viciously crossed it out. Congratulations, you found evidence of the crime. Is that enough? Because that's pretty damning. But you haven't arrested the villain. Right, let's go get her. Where are you? Find Tamara. This doesn't always work. The last you knew, she was in the first floor corridor. Yes, I know, that's where I am, and she's not here now, is she? So, where is she? We now have to proceed on a little wild goose chase. See if we can track her down. Jack, where is Tamara? I don't know if this works. To locate something, use the command find something. Jack, find Tamara. Always having a good think about that. The last you know, she was unhelpful. Where are you? Where are you? No, nope. not in here. No. Nope. I don't think she runs away. Ah, there she is. To the west, Tamara appears from the old Great Hall. Accuse Tamara. You can't see. She's right there. Look at Tamara. Tamara is walking along. She enters the ground floor corridor. <sighs> right, we now got to follow her until she stops wandering. Tamara is searching. All right, she's stopped. So, accuse Tamara. At first, she denies everything, but when you tell, about, tell her about Tamara's receipt, she rushes at you. Suddenly, Bolitha appears and grabs her from behind, saying, I'll guard this villain for you. And Tamara glares at you and confesses to fraud. Congratulations, Mr. Davison. Would you like to read the author's version of the crime? Why, yes. Yes, I would. Tamara doubted that she could hold Lord Jack's love. She was both jealous and fearful of Iris as a rival who might someday take Jack away from her. So she tried to defame Iris by making it appear Iris was a vengeful ghost bent on killing Jack's new love, Tamara. Deirdre's death was purely an accident. Congratulations, Mr. Davison, you've won the game. 
And there we go. There we have it. That is Moon Mist. Um, as I say, this is quite a divisive one among Inf Infocom fans because some people think that the conclusion to each of the scenarios is a little bit unsatisfying. I, I, I can see where they're coming from on that. Um, but at the same time, there are four of them to uncover and each one does unfold quite differently. And there are two that initially look like they're unfolding in the same way before going off in different directions. Um, I like the fact that you can play through it and be done with it in like an hour or so, like we're done here. Um, because there's, there's, there, aren't, there isn't really any wasted space in this game. There's some locations in which not a lot happens and some locations which are not relevant to any of the routes, but they're there to just sort of flesh out the setting. And I think that's quite nice. It's a shame that not all of the room descriptions are in the game, uh, but I also understand why, because they wanted to get people to look at the feelies and they wanted to use the feelies as a form of copy protection, because there are a couple of instances where you won't know something you need to examine is in a room unless you look at the tourist brochure, um, which I think is quite interesting. I, I happen to like that, and other people hate it, so you, your mileage may vary. But anyway, yes, that is Moon Mist, the Atari 8-bit version uh, of a classic Infocom adventure. I hope you enjoyed that. I know this was a fairly unconventional video, and there wasn't really a lot to watch besides some text scrolling up the screen. Um, but hopefully, hopefully that was reasonably entertaining uh, and that you enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed playing through it, and I have now finished all four routes of Moon Mist, so I can set that aside, satisfied that after... 42 years on this earth, nearly 43, I have finally finished an Infocom game for the first time. <laughs> it's a proud moment, for sure. Anyway, just remains for me to say, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time. <laughs>